Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Trauma Verification's February Q&A web conference. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default for audio. If you'd prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone in the audio pane in the attendee control panel to the right of your screen and the dial-in information will be displayed. I would now like to introduce Molly Lazada, Trauma Verification Program Manager. Molly? Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Um, for today's uh, webinar, Megan um, Hudgens and Bumi Parikh will be doing the presentation. I will do the intro so, um, so you're going to get to uh, know them a little better. Um, just some housekeeping items that I need to go over. Continuing education to qualify for CE, you must attend at least 50 minutes of educational content. An email will be sent to all attendees who qualify for CE within 24 hours of the webinar ending with instructions on how to claim those CE. If you have any questions during this presentation or if you have any additional questions, please email us at cotbrc at facs.org. I do want to let everyone know that we have some construction going on, so you may hear some um, uh, drilling or hammering in the background, so please accept our apologies for that. The goal for today's webinar is to interpret the standards outlined in the resources for optimal care of the injured patient manual to ensure that hospitals have an understanding of the criteria to provide quality care to the injured patient, understand the processes and standards involved in an ACS trauma verification site visit and how following these will positively impact the quality of care of the injured patient at your trauma center. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, for anyone who's new to our presentation or to our webinar rather, uh, please be sure to have a copy of the resources manual as a reference guide, or uh, if you don't have a hard copy available, you can download a PDF copy from our website. Um, in addition with the, the manual and the um, PDF copy, you also want to download a copy of the clarification documents and the change log. As many of you are aware, we're going through some revisions. Um, and if the committee um, decides, not the committee, the VRC committee, but the COT committee decides that something will be implemented immediately and not need to wait for the new manual to be released, we will let everyone know during this presentation, during our monthly newsletter, or it will be noted in the change log, the verification change log you see here. So again, in conjunction with the manual or the PDF copy, you want to have the change log because standards have changed since the release of the Orange Book in 2014. Some resources for new uh, members or new TPMs and Toronto Medical Directors um, can be found on our resources webpage. Um, the recordings of the webinars will be available um, on its own webpage. Uh, we do have them starting from 2016. And again, things have changed. Um, and uh, we are going to be looking at um, updating some of those um, presentations or just taking them down because they no longer um, may be applicable. Stakeholder public comment website is still open uh, for anyone who wants to comment on um, standards. Um, again, many of you know we're going under a revision process and there are a ton of chapters. Actually, all the chapters except chapter six has been uh, completed uh, that has been approved by the executive committee. Um, and I do want to let everyone know we will not be releasing chapters one at a time. Um, nor, again, if there is something that um, it's crucial and it will impact a trauma center, a, the executive committee of the Committee on Trauma can make the decision to go ahead and implement that standard immediately. So um, as of now, all chapters will be released at the same time. And again, that timeline is still pending as to when that will be coming. Um, so there's a couple of tutorials. Um, again, those may be updated based on new information um, and new processes that we've implemented. Um, the participant hub for folks who are new again or um, there's been transition in your trauma center, you can log in and control your hospital profile, meaning you can update your contact list, trauma medical director, uh, if you want to add additional people to your um, account center, you can go ahead and do that by logging in and um, updating that information. 
Um, and then again, the expanded FAQ is still it is available. Um, there's over 100 questions, frequently asked questions that um, you can go ahead and reference there. Um, disclaimer, all questions are pulled directly from the questions that are submitted to this webinar. There have been no edits made to those contents. If your question is not answered during today's webinar, um, the question may require more information and we will reach out to you for additional information. And what usually may happen is that we will email them offline and, um, and sometimes we will bring that back to present and the following month's webinar. Um, scheduling reminders and updates, uh, just to let everyone know, we will be presenting that every other month and the next month will be March 2019. For announcements, our next webinar is scheduled for um, March 26th, uh, Tuesday, March 26th at noon Central Standard Time. The deadline to submit questions will be Monday, March, March 11th. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, present Bumi Parikh, and she will go over the general questions. All right, hi everyone. I will be presenting on the general questions, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first question is, is a trauma PI coordinator required to be a nurse? So the VRC does not have any requirements regarding this position. The resources for new trauma program managers. So where is the best place to find resources for a new trauma program manager? So as Molly mentioned previously in the previous slide, the VRC resources webpage has several tutorials that we will be beneficial regarding this. So the next question is regarding ICU. For patients admitted to ICU, can an APP see the patient in place of a physician or does it need to be an intensivist? And by when? And this is in reference to level two. So an APP cannot take the place of a physician. This role is performed by a physician by a physician who has been credentialed to provide care to the trauma patients while in the ICU. It is required that they respond within 15 minutes for a level two trauma center. And an additional reference is um, page 81 in the orange book, and that includes the ICU coverage consolations table. So admissions and visits. Um, do you consider an ED patient a visit or an admission in regards to adding patient to the registry, and this is in reference to the level three trauma center. Without having specific data regarding this patient, if the patient has a mechanism of injury and it meets the national trauma data set inclusion criteria, the patient would be an admission and entered into the trauma history. Board certification. Do any providers, in reference to EM, ortho, neuro, GS, or critical care have to maintain board certification or is it only if in place of CME requirements? And this is in reference to a level one. So maintaining current board certification or eligibility for certification is required for all providers who take trauma call, whether it's a level one, two, or three trauma center. The guidelines for transferring patients. So is there an acceptable time frame in which an accepting facility should provide feedback to the transferring facility? And this is in reference to a level three. So there's no requirement for um, the time frame, but ideally you'd want to provide or receive feedback in a timely manner. National committees. Can you specify the requirement for leadership roles on national committees? And is this only for trauma physicians? This is for a level one trauma center. Um, just to note that this is only a requirement for the TMD, and this is CD 5-8. It's a requirement for level one and level two trauma centers, but it's desirable for TMDs in level three and four. Um, so we have provided a list of acceptable organizations for the level one, for the level one and level two TMDs. Neurotrauma diversion versus contingency. How is the neurotrauma diversion plan different from the contingency plan for when, for times in which a neurosurgeon is encumbered? And this is in reference to a level one. So when the neurosurgeon primary and backup are encumbered prior to the arrival of the neurosurgeon 
single patient, whether they are in the operating room tied up with another patient or in route, in route to in route or delayed, or there are no available beds, the trauma center has alerted the EMS and that they are unable to accept any new patients. They will need to be diverted to another facility. So in this case, the trauma center will need a contingency plan. So the contingency plan can be in the form of a backup call schedule. And then uh, when the neurosurgeon, neurosurgical primary and backup are encumbered upon the arrival of the neurosurgeon, neurosurgical patient, whether they end up, they're in the operating room or tied up with another trauma patient, the trauma center is able to accept neurosurgical patients, but the contingency plan is once again activated. Nurse certification. So is there a percentage of RNs that are needed to be TNCC trained in the ED for a level three trauma center? So there's no requirement regarding um, the completion of TNCC. However, um, the only requirement is CD17-4 in that there must be a mechanism in place to allow for trauma-related education for nurses involved in trauma care. Um, once again, as this is not a requirement on nursing education, however, reviewers will sometimes cite this as a weakness if the threshold is below 30% in the areas where trauma patients are being prepared for. Orange Book revisions. How long would centers have to update to any revisions for the new Orange Book if released this year and in regards to re-verification purposes for a level one trauma center? So the VRC provides a one-year grace period from the release date of the new, year, the new resources manual. For example, if the manual is released in January 2020 and a center is due for a visit within that year, it will be reviewed under the new Orange Book. And this is Molly, just a really quick um, um, thing I want to point out. Um, I was present for the release of the orange book from the green to the orange book. Um, I know I'm dating myself, but anyway, um, so what we did in that instance, and I didn't want to put all that in the slide, but um, we will let folks know when the new book is coming out and when the effective date is going to be. And as Bumi pointed out, there is going to be a grace period of a year. We won't um, shortchange anyone on this. So once the book is released and hoping that it will be sometime late this year or early next year, um, there will be a year where trauma centers who are having a visit during that year will be reviewed under the Orange Book and then this effective date kicks in. And um, what we plan to do is reach out to those trauma centers that may be affected by that effective date if it happens to fall you know, during the reporting year or during when you're planning on scheduling a visit. So we will have some um, planning around that and we will make sure that everyone is aware of that. Thanks, Molly. The next question is on per diem um, trauma surgeon peer review meetings. So if a per diem trauma surgeon is on call once a month, are they exempt from attending peer review if the TMD provides reviews? And this is in reference to level two. Um, the answer is no, they will be held to the same standard and will be required to attend these meetings. So as a reminder, the peer review meetings may be attended in person or by phone or video conferencing. PTSD screening. So are there any plans for developing requirements for PTSD screenings for trauma patients? And this is in reference to level one. So chapter 18 is currently under revision by the work group. And with that said, presently screening for PTSD is not required. However, if, if your center sees a large number of patients that suffer from PTSD, reviewers may ask questions as to how these patients are managed and whether or not there is a screening tool. To confirm, if there's not a mechanism in place for PTSD, it will not be cited as a deficiency. So just to add on for the PTSD screening tool, so does the ACS have a preferred PTSD screening tool? And this is in reference to level one. So as stated, PTSD screening is not required. However, if your center performs PTSD screening on trauma patients, there is a document on the VRC resources webpage on diagnostic criteria and a 17 point checklist that can be utilized as a PTSD screening tool. And this is also listed on the website. The next question is on social workers. Do you have to have a dedicated trauma social worker? This is for a level one. 
And the other question was, are trauma nurse navigators work, or our trauma nurse navigator works with CM on DC, ESPER, and ASD, but we do not have a dedicated social worker. Is this acceptable? So the quick answer is a medical social worker should be available 24 seven in level one and two trauma centers. But however, there is no requirement that the social worker needs to be dedicated to the trauma program. Next question is on the trauma program manager. I am the TPM of a level three trauma center that is in the process of building a 13 bed freestanding ED affiliated with the facility. Does this affect the required staffing of the trauma program? Can a TPM for a level three facility cover more than one building? When asking does this affect the required staffing of the trauma program, I believe this is me, this, this to mean in the role of the TPM. If correct, it does not affect the staffing in that sense. In level three trauma centers, the TPM does not need to be a full-time or dedicated to the trauma program. So direct admit. Is there any criteria for trauma patients who are transferred and directly admitted to the floor and bypass the ED? This is in reference to a level two. So there are no um, requirements or criteria regarding direct admit. Um, however, the VRC does recommend that patients who have been transferred in with a full workup at another facility be assessed in the ED for the opportunity to identify additional injuries. And if these um, patients are directly admitted, you'd want to track and monitor them through the PIPS process. PALS or BLS? Do general surgeons have to have PALS or BLS current for ACS verification? even if it's not required by the hospital. And this is in reference to a level one. No, uh, the VRC does not have requirements for this. Hospice, if a patient is discharged and admitted to inpatient hospice, which is in the same facility, is this a discharge or a death? And this is for a level one. So if the patient was admitted to an inpatient hospice unit within the hospital or to an external hospice facility, based on your hospital policy, it may be considered a discharge or a transfer. The expectation for these cases is that the care of the patient leading up to the discharge or transfer is evaluated through the process, the PIPS process by the TMD and or TPM. And during this process, if there are any issues that are found, it should be reviewed at the peer review. Um, and if the, the hospice patient died while in the trauma service, it would be reviewed as a death. Alcohol screening, so clarification on the alcohol screening tool. If the patient has an alcohol level but was not asked about alcohol use during this, or does this count as a screening? So this is for a level three. So the answer is yes. Patients that had an alcohol level should, and it would count as alcohol screening tool. Alternate pathway criteria. So if a surgeon did not train in the US, but, it had, but they have completed several fellowships, can he take trauma call if, in, if he is um, current in ETLS? And this is in reference to a level three. So if, if um, they have trained, or if there is a US or Canadian non-boarded certified um, surgeon who did not train in the US or in Canada, but have completed several US fellowships, they may be acceptable to participate on the trauma call panel if they have been approved by the way of the alternate pathway criteria. So once again, please reference that um, link and then it should indicate the alternate pathway criteria. So re-verification for reporting year. So is it possible to change the reporting year for an upcoming re-verification review? So the reporting year would be still no older than 14 months. For example, the previous reporting year for re-verification review was August to July. Can we change this to September to August? And this is in reference to a level two. So um, overall, this will depend on when the visit is scheduled for. Given the date span above, if the visit is scheduled for October or November, you may use the reporting period of September through October, or September through August. And then this, repair, this reporting year would also be the same for any other type of visit. So verification site visit. So is there a new format for choosing PI charts before the site, for, before the site reviewers visit? 
So no, we had originally launched a chart pilot project with a small group of trauma centers. However, this pilot project concluded in 2018 and the results would be presented at the annual COT meeting in March. Um, so nurse reviewers on site visit. So what is the role of a trauma nurse surveyor? So the trauma, the nurse reviewer or surveyor um, on a site visit is typically assigned the following sections of the PRQ, and that will usually include the TPM, the registry, the advanced practitioners, education and outreach, prevention, and testing. And um, the nurse reviewers are usually detail-oriented as your peer, and they will review several different um, items, such as nursing practices, um, shared best practices, practices as well as standards of care and then additional documentation along with other recommendations for this. So chart reviews. What do you do when you don't have 10 charts for a particular topic for verification reviews? So for categories that you do not have a minimum of 10 charts, um, so the most important thing is to pull what you have at the time of the site visit. And this can be a mixture of um, cases that demonstrate your PI process or some that don't. So, and then this can be also the instance for um, all types of site visits, whether it be consultation, re-verification, or verification and focus. Chart reviews. Um, so I just wanted to clarify for our upcoming focus review, we need to pull 10 of each of the categories of charts, just as we did for the initial review, correct? So for focus reviews, the categories and numbers of charts are dependent on what was cited as deficiencies and when the changes were implemented leading up to the site visit. So it is conceivable that the number of charts may be close to that of the initial review. So as noted in the previous slide, if you do not have 10 charts of each of the categories, pull what you have at the time of the focus visit. And just to note that if there's a polytrauma case, do not copy the chart, just flag it and place it in whichever category you believe is the most appropriate. So the last question is trauma alert. So is the registrar supposed to attend trauma alerts as suggested by last month's webinar? And this is in reference to a level two. So who responds to trauma alerts will depend on the hospital's guidelines. But in respect to the question submitted during the December webinar, the question was submitted, the question submitted was what personnel arrival times need to be recorded or documented at bedside. And as you can see on the slide, that's, um, to the right, um, the line on the register was corrected. I'm just going to turn this off to Megan, who will be presenting on the CD related questions. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Boomi. This is Megan here to go over some more specific, uh, more targeted CD related questions on um, the individual criteria. So let's get started. And the first question we have is on transfers. The December webinar slide 54 says to review transfers in and out, but the clarification document page four says transfers out. Help, this is from level two. Uh, so to clarify this a little bit, I apologize for any confusion. The trauma center must perform a PIPS review of all transfers as per CD43. Uh, all transfers in and out must be reviewed. So, um, the list on page 33 of the resource manual titled Receiving Physician Responsibilities uh, is going to provide you with a general framework for a PI, uh, PIPS process, uh, including feedback to the referring facility. Uh, key elements for this might, uh, might include uh, MD, MD communication prior to transfer, trauma team response, such as uh, awaiting upon patient arrival, any opportunity for improvement occurring at the sending hospital, on route to the hospital, or at your facility, feedback to the sending hospital regarding care rendered prior to transfer, and uh, whatever outcome there was at your facility. Now, these are all possi uh, only possible examples. The PI process should be developed in a manner that best suits the needs of both the transferring and receiving facilities. Here's one on OPPE. Regarding the OPPE slide in the January webinar, what services would you expect to see an OPPE, OPPE on? Neurosurgery, uh, NRS, ortho, what about uh, radiology, anesthesia, and emergency medicine? Uh, great question. So the intent is that all panel members who care for trauma patients in any capacity have an OPPE conducted. 
Uh, this is going to include, uh, as noted in the question, radiology, anesthesia, and emergency medicine. The TMD does not need to perform the OPPE on those panel members. Uh, this does come up pretty often, so we wanted to make sure we clarified again. Uh, but he or she must have oversight in the process to ensure that they're compliant with verification requirements. So some kind of sign off. The actual OPPE process can be done by whoever is in charge of that particular specialty. Here's a question on highest level of activation. Who is required to respond to the highest level of activation? Uh, so the team composition for the highest level of activation will vary by your institution and institutional needs, but this may be comprised of any of the following, including, but not limited to, the ED physician, the trauma surgeon, which you will note is required, nurses, the scribe, uh, resident, anesthesia, pharmacist, any of those, and many more. Here's a question for limited tier activations. For the level two activations, once the trauma surgeon is notified, do they have 30 minutes to respond to the bedside? Um, so the institution will define the time and injury expectation for when the trauma surgeon, uh, be it an adult or pediatric trauma surgeon, will respond to the limited tier activation or level two activation, however it's referred to at your institution. Uh, most centers have a metric between 30 minutes and up to six hours based on the mechanism of injury. The most important thing, and we'll say this for a lot of the criteria, is to monitor the metrics through the PIPS process to just ensure that the center is adhering to its own policies. And another one on limited tier activation. Uh, do surgeons need to see level two trauma activations within 30 minutes if the patient has been in the ED for a period of time, the workup has already been completed, and the, and the workup has already been completed when they're notified? So as previously mentioned in the last slide, the institution will define the response time for limited tier activations for the trauma surgeon uh, to respond to the injured patient just based on institutional need. If the trauma center imposed a 30 minute response time for the uh, trauma surgeon to respond to the level two activation, then it's expected that the trauma surgeon will see the patient during that time. And another one on limited tier activations. For level two activations, is it okay to have the ED physician respond and only page out the trauma surgeon if needed? Uh, so yeah, it's perfectly acceptable for the emergency department physician to respond to limited tier activations or level two activations, but the center must have a criteria for when the trauma surgeon is expected to respond to the limited tier activation. And here's a question on trauma program managers for combined centers. If you are a combined level one adult and level two pediatric, do you have to have two separate program managers for a level one? Oh, yes. Uh, so in verified adult level one and level two pediatric trauma centers, there must be a full one FTE trauma program manager dedicated to each program. Uh, the pediatric program may have a pediatric trauma coordinator and this person may have additional duties as long as it doesn't encumber their duties as the TPC, such as uh, they can also be the trauma registrar for the trauma program or the injury prevention coordinator uh, for the pediatric trauma program. Here's a question on the chair of the trauma peer review meeting. The December webinar says that the TMD or associate TMD must chair all PI meetings, but the January webinar states that the TMD has to be at 50% of these meetings. Please clarify. Okay, so uh, let us clarify. The December webinar said that the uh, TMD or associate TMD must chair the trauma peer review meeting. There is no alternate representative that will satisfy criteria. And what we're talking about by alternate, uh, for the other specialty members, an alternate member of the team may be appointed to attend the peer review meeting in their place. Uh, in which their combined attendance must equal 50%. Um, following that vein, the TMD cannot appoint an alternate, so he or she must chair and at least attend 50% of these meetings. Uh, for example, the trauma center has 12 meetings in a year, one meeting per month. The TMD must chair and attend six of those meetings to be compliant. The associate TMD, which is typically another trauma surgeon, may also chair the other six meetings, but that surgeon's attendance cannot be combined with the TMD's attendance. So the, uh, the associate TMD cannot basically be their alternate. 
And here's a question on neurosurgery diversion. If the facility does not have a neurosurgeon available, does the facility need to go on diversion? This is for a level two. So if the on-call neurosurgeon is encumbered, the trauma surgeon must have a diversion plan to divert the patients. This must include uh, emergency medical services notification of neurosurgery advisory status and diversion, a thorough review of each instance by the, uh, by the PIPS program, and monitoring of the effectiveness of the process, again, by the PIPS program. Here's another que or question on neurosurgery board certification. We are considering onboarding another neurosurgeon that is boarded through AANS, the American Academy of Neurologic Surgery, and not through the American Board of Neurological Surgery or American Osteopathic Association, as referenced on page 55 of the Orange Book. Does the ACS recognize the American Academy of Neurologic Surgery for board certification? I verified it is recognized by the ABMS, but wanted to make sure the ACS didn't exclude it. This is for a level two. So to clarify, um, the AANS is a, actually a surgical membership organization, so they're not a certifying body. As such, unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to use AANS membership to satisfy the requirement CD810. So it would have to be the um, ABNS. Here's a question on orthopedic surgeon board, or board eligibility. If an orthopedic surgeon is board certified eligible, if so board eligible, is this acceptable for caring for trauma patients? This is for a level two. And yes, yes, that would totally be acceptable. Um, having a board eligible, being board eligible for certification for any of the specialty panel members and trauma surgery are acceptable to care for trauma patients. So yeah, uh, not just ortho, but anybody, neuro, anesthesia, trauma, anybody. Here's one for uh, board certification for anesthesia and radiology. Do all the anesthesiologists and radiologists have to maintain board certification in a level one trauma center or just the liaison? So it's not actually required for all members of the anesthesia and radiology panel to maintain board certification. Uh, board certification or eligibility for certification is required for the liaison as per CD 1111. And the radiologist liaison, as per CD 1143, uh, who, uh, who take call in level one and two trauma centers. And you're going to want to refer to the verification change log for any updates regarding these two standards. Here's one regarding the ICU director. Must the TMD also be the medical director over the ICU? Uh, so, no, uh, the TMD is not required to also be the director of the ICU. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it, it happens, certainly, but uh, in a level two trauma center, there must be a board certified general surgeon appointed as the ICU director. This could be the TMD or anyone else who fits that, uh, who fits that description. Uh, this surgeon also, as an important note, does not have to be boarded in surgical critical care. And another one on the ICU director. Our facility has a separate trauma ICU with occasional overflow from the medical surgical ICU. Daily rounds and administrative decisions are managed by trauma surgeons that are boarded in critical care. Regarding CD 1153, can the TMD also serve as the surgical director of the ICU or does it have to be a separate surgeon? So we could have probably combined two slides, I'm sorry. Uh, it's level one and three, uh, sorry, two and three trauma centers. The TMD may also serve as the ICU director uh, and again, the TMD is not required to be boarded in surgical critical care. All right, and here's one on ICU emergencies. Can telemedicine ICU and hospital medicine meet initial response to trauma emergency in the ICU while the surgeon is en route? This is for a level three. Telemedicine is not an acceptable method of consult, unfortunately. Uh, the requirement is that a credentialed provider must be available in person at the patient's bedside within 30 minutes at a level three trauma center. And you're gonna to wanna to refer to, uh, as Bumi pointed out earlier, the ICU co coverage constellations table in the resources manual on page 81. Here's one on microvascular surgery, covering CDs 1170 and 1171. Please clarify the criteria for microvascular surgery since there is no board certification for this specialty. 
is this under the purview of plastic surgery, hand surgery, vascular surgery, or any other surgical specialty that utilizes a microscope during surgery? Are there any particular requirements, such as a certificate or proof of education in microvascular surgery? This surgical specialty is required for level one and level two centers and is a type two deficiency. So the intent is primarily just to make sure that the center has microvascular capability. And the way that you can satisfy this requirement is just ensuring that your facility has a surgeon on hand who can use an operating microscope, microscope for nerve repair, free tissue transfer, free flap, et cetera. Uh, the microvascular capability is not required in-house 24 seven, important note, uh, but there must be a surgeon consultant available to respond in person when this is requested by the attending surgeon within a predetermined time. Here's a question on ophthalmology, ED 1171. As a level two, is it acceptable to have only partial call for ophthalmology if there are transfer agreements in place? So we weren't entirely sure what partial call meant in this case, so we'll be uh, contacting this person for more information. But uh, for the part that we can't answer, uh, the requirement for other surgical specialists such as ophthalmology uh, is just that uh, there's, it, as we discussed in the last one, that there must be a provider available to respond in person when requested by the attending surgeon within a predetermined time. But again, very important. I know that there's concern over this. Uh, the capability is not required in-house 24-7. Here's a question on registrar education. Do trauma registrars at level one trauma centers need continuing education credit, or is it just TMDs and TPMs? Uh, so trauma registrars should have continuing education. We put that forward as a best practices sort of situation, uh, but they are not required to have it. As per CD 15-7, uh, the only education that we're really looking for is the American Trauma Society's trauma registrar course or an equivalent and the Association of the Advancement of Automotive Medicine's Injury Scaling course. Uh, but beyond that, we're not looking for CME for the registrar. Uh, but for the TPM and TND, yes, you are correct. They do still have to have continuing education credit, or continuing medical education credits or continuing ed education. And here's another question on registrar admissions as per CD 15.9. Is the FTE requirement for registrars pertaining to uh, pertaining just to data submitted to NTBB slash TQIP or all patients entered into the registry? This is from a level three. So currently the requirement is based on the number of trauma admissions. It's not based on data points for submission to NTBB or TQIP. So we're just looking at the raw volume uh, 500 to 750. Here's one on alcohol screening, CD 18.3. Level three expert, does there need to be a question for, does there just need to be a question for consumption? Does the question need to pertain to current intoxication? And uh, that's for level three. And then from a level two, could the physician's dictated note, patient denies ETO use, be used in place of, of the cage screening? So um, for all trauma centers, the, the core of this requirement is that the facility will determine a validated screening tool. And in the latter question, having a physician's dictated note would not be acceptable in this case. The screening tool doesn't need to be CAGE. Uh, there's several options you'll find in the PRQ that um, you can check for um, what screening tool you use, but it does have to be a validated screening tool. So if a dictated note would not work in this case. Here's one for research, CDs 19.1 and 19.4. Research requirement, if there is a multi-site study, can both sites use the paper to count towards the research requirement? And if clinicians from multi-sites participate in research, but the patient population is only from one site, can it count for both? So the terms multi-system multi and multi-center are used interchangeably within the verification program. Uh, the centers that will be involved in a multi-center slash multi-system research project must involve members of the trauma team or specialty surgeons and include data from both facilities. Uh, the trauma surgeons or specialty surgeons from both facilities must also be listed as authors. A little bit of a longer one here, for again, for research. 
at a combined adult and pediatric center where they wish to be an adult level one and pediatric level one, can you explain the criteria for research? The clarification document notes, uh, 10 PTC1, in combined level one adult and pediatric centers, half of the research requirement must be pediatric research, uh, uh, CD1011 type two, refer to the VRC research statement at the end of the document. If a center desires to use the alternate method of 10 peer-reviewed articles and seven scholarly activities, would this mean that there would need to be five articles for pediatrics and five from adults? Also, should we assume that none of these articles can overlap, one article count twice, one for adults and one for pediatrics, even if the study includes pediatric and adult patients? And to, uh, to answer that, uh, to clarify combined centers, we did discuss it before as well, but just to clarify in case anyone is wondering, uh, these are hospitals, like a hospital within a hospital or a hospital that's connected uh, to another with, uh, via a tunnel or walkway. Uh, in a combined adult level one and pediatric level one center, each program must have 20 peer reviewed articles published in journals included in PubMed in a three year period. Uh, for the pediatric program, half of these must be pediatric specific and the other half may overlap with the adult articles. So in a combined adult level one and pediatric level one, uh, utilizing the alternate pathway. Uh, in this case, each program would have to uh, complete, would, ha would have to submit 10 peer reviewed articles published in journals and four scholarly activities. And you can find this detailed in the orange book. The articles cannot overlap. However, it is conceivable that scholarly activities may overlap between the two programs. And here's another one for research. Can the ACS further clarify CD194? The clarification document states may include one article from acute care surgery. How many articles count towards the requirement from acute care surgery? Is it unlimited? Is it unlimited like the other disciplines? We have, uh, we have two separate articles on general surgery topics that do not include trauma patients that originated at a AAST and EAST meeting. Would we be able to include both of them or only one? Only one article from acute care surgery can be counted towards the requirement. All the other research articles would have to result from work related to the trauma center or the trauma system in which the trauma center participates. And here's another one for research. So many for research today. Uh, can you comment on alternate pathway research uh, on the alternate pathway for research requirements? How many of those alternate requirements must be fulfilled? Uh, so for the research alternate pathway, the center must have 10 peer-reviewed articles authored by members of the trauma team and specialty members and must include four scholarly activities. And we do have a page number. It's a, if you refer to page 145 of the orange book, uh, break down exactly what the scholarly activities are. And moving on to CME. Just a couple quick ones here, uh, one for MOC. What evidence is required during the site survey to confirm MOC compliance? Does the, cor the current board cert satisfy this requirement? And yes, uh, the current board certification or eligibility will be sufficient. And lastly, um, the reviewer suggested there be a CME slash IEP. However, this is no longer a requirement. Uh, is the expectation that we go above and beyond what is now required because it was a weakness on our review in 2016 for a pediatric center at level two. Uh, so you won't be cited as CD for not having CME or IEP. This does, of course, exclude the TPM, the TMD, and any alternate pathway surgeons who would be required to, uh, to have CME. Uh, but to address this weakness, uh, you would just exclude the CME and IEP component of it entirely and focus on how the trauma center is addressing the lapse of knowledge in care of pediatric trauma patients. So this is Molly. I just want to go over a couple of things. Um, I know there's a lot of research questions, so um, if anyone has any questions about that, um, we are streamlining that. That chapter is actually up for review um, with the executive committee. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if the executive committee feels that that research requirement um, or the change in the research requirement um, would be helpful for trauma centers, they will ask us to go ahead and um, implement that immediately. Um, 
And uh, again, just to let everyone know, we are working on the resources book as uh, quickly as possible in the revision process. And uh, we have all the chapters up and going with the work groups and they are each being individually reviewed. There are some chapters we have not received or seen for edits. And um, again, we will be reaching out to those folks just to get those in so we can get um, the new manual up and going and release as soon as possible. Um, and um, I guess the other thing I wanted to um, say is we had a question in, um, somebody just submitted a question and thank you, Sarah, for monitoring that. And um, it was the question about, um, that Bumi brought up was, do you consider an ET patient a visit or an admission in regards to the adding the patient to the registry and the answer that was given may be misleading and we just wanna um, make sure that we answer that correctly to the person who submitted that. So if the question was regarding um, a registry patient who was discharged from the registry, um, we just wanna clarify um, that further. So we may be following up with um, more questions to make sure we answer that appropriately during the presentation. Um, so again, if anyone has any questions, um, you can contact us through the COTVRC inbox um, and uh, we will hopefully get your answers uh, answered in a timely manner. Um, and we apologize if there was a couple of questions in our presentation that um, overlap, but we wanna make sure that we are answering, answering them um, as you submitted them. So they may read a little differently and that's why we kept them in the, the presentation and didn't uh, combine them. Um, so um, again, uh, we look forward to next month's uh, webinar. Um, and if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, and I just wanted to say um, thank you for participating with us and um, letting our team present for you. And you will be hearing from Megan and Boomi more often uh, during these webinars. Um, so Megan, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so um, we're really glad to be uh, joining in on these webinars with you guys. Um, you will definitely be hearing from Boomi or I uh, as you go through the visit process. Um, we do a validation of the PRQ before every site visit. So, um, yeah. So we, um, yeah, we check in, just make sure everything makes sense. Uh, so you uh, definitely will be hearing from us. Well, probably, uh, yeah, you'll be hearing from us. So, um, yeah. Uh, moving on. Thank you guys so much for your participation. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Um. Thank you so much to the trauma verification staff. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, Trauma Verification's February Q&A web conference. If you have any other questions, please contact COTVRC at FACS.org. <clears throat> On behalf of Trauma Verification and our presenters, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.